730 on your Thursday morning as the surge in national COVID-19 cases continues to rise. We're taking a closer look at a new interactive tool, how you can track the odds of someone at a local event having COVID-19. And ballots are mailed for the August 4th primary. This morning we look at the race for U.S. Congress in Eastern Washington and how much money the leading candidates raised. Up with Krim begins now. One of our favorite stories this morning, a local Girl Scout has gone above and beyond when it comes to selling boxes of cookies. And no, we're not talking a few hundred boxes. We're talking 23,000. You heard me correct. 23,000 boxes of those sweet, sweet Girl Scout cookies. Dana Marie joining us just a little bit later to fill us in on this amazing feat. And Dana Marie, I think the, th the thing that stands out to me is the look on your face when she said, oh no, this is the most ever. I was just in <laughs> shock. I mean, the fact that we have a local girl here from Post Falls selling so many of those cookies. She worked so hard, almost 200 hours she dedicated. Uh, she's going to have a really successful future. I oh, yeah. Lung entrepreneur, young entrepreneur being developed right here in the in the Northwest. Exactly. Love to see. We have more on that story coming up with Dana Marie in just a little bit as we take a look outside for our Thursday morning forecast with Evan Narani. Good morning. Yeah, it is a dry start to the day. A beautiful one at that. We're expecting another day of sunny skies. A few clouds that will build this afternoon and a little bit of a change on the way, which will be a breeze. We haven't really seen much wind at all this week, but today is going to be kind of that switch as this dry cold front makes its way through. Jumping up to the 20 mile per hour range for your wind gusts here in eastern Washington. Off toward central Washington, gustier winds possibly in the 30 mile per hour range. Let's take a look at where we are right now to start off your morning. Uh, so far, mainly high single digits out there, so nothing too intense as far as your wind speeds go. That's because this cold front has yet to pass and uh, as it does so, that's when we'll see those most intense winds. So later today in the afternoon and evening and then tonight into tomorrow, we'll see those winds really pick up dramatically and that's what's going to definitely be a cause for concern, especially related to our fire danger going into the next couple days. Uh, that breeze drops off as we head into your weekend, but temperatures are going to stay in the low 80s for Saturday and Sunday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday really. Uh, but for today, we're talking one of the warmer days, definitely. Today's even warmer than yesterday. We've just been on an upward tra trajectory for the last couple days, so we're making it to about 88 degrees, maybe even hitting 89 between about 3 and 5 p.m. Notice those clouds are going to be the main contributor to stopping us from getting there. So depending on how thick that cloud cover is, that could affect uh, how uh, how intense those temperatures are uh, or whether or not we'll make it to the 90s off towards certain parts of central Washington. Well, a federal judge in Spokane dismissed a lawsuit challenging Governor Jay Inslee's coronavirus emergency declaration. Slidewaters, a water park in Chelan County, filed a lawsuit against Governor Inslee on June 8th. The water park remained open in violation of the governor's order. In a press release from the governor's office, the judge wrote Governor Inslee's emergency power clearly encompasses an outbreak of a pandemic disease. The judge previously rejected the water park's motion for a temporary restraining order against enforcement of the emergency proclamation rules. The judge also ruled the Department of Labor and Industries legally exercised its authority to develop rules to enforce the governor's proclamation. A new report finds that reopening schools without taking the right measures may lead to a significant rise in coronavirus cases. This report comes from King County and the Institute for Disease Modeling. Now using data out of King County, the report found that Washington schools could reopen, but only with countermeasures in place. Also, it would require the transmission of the coronavirus stay low in a local community. Mask usage, physical distancing, hygiene, and grouping students by age are all listed as necessary in this report. And according to that report, without these countermeasures, cases could double over the first three months of the school year. Now, Washington's Deputy Secretary for the Department of Health says, quote, Reopening schools cannot be considered in isolation. What happens outside of schools is as important as what happens inside of schools. Across state line, the Idaho State Board of Education has approved a grant program to help school districts prepare for blended learning. The grant will make $3.8 million available to help students and teachers who do not have online access. It will be up to each school district on how they use that grant money. Board members do estimate that up to 45,000 students do not have access to a computer or to the internet right now.
And if you'd like more information on heading back to school next fall, all you have to do is text the word schools to 509-448-2000. We will share some of the latest information for you from across the Inland Northwest. 735 now researchers have created a new interactive tool to give us all a closer look at why larger events have been canceled across the country and around the world, but it also gives us a tool to look at our own everyday lives and calculate the risk of any event we might be thinking about attending. You're looking at the interactive tool right now that comes from the Biosciences Department at Georgia Tech. We have a link to their website online at crem.com. You can also see at the bottom of the screen right now. And let me show you basically how it works. I'm going to use my own tablet right here just to run you through it. I'm going to start off by going to the left side here and looking at the event size. If you start by selecting the event size, let's just go down to, let's say about 50 people. This is going to generate every county across the country showing the current risk of someone at that event having a positive or having COVID-19. Of course, a lot of this is based on testing percentages. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. But as I go up to Spokane County, let's select right there. Based on 50 people, there's a 57% risk level that someone at that event would have COVID-19. Of course, as I mentioned, based on testing numbers. But that brings up another point. For months, there has been a lot of criticism and a lot of questions about just how accurate and effective states have been when it comes to how much testing they are doing for people for COVID-19. So I selected another tab here on the same website with another feature that gives us a real time look at cases that are tracked at the US and the state level. Same thing over on the left side here. We're going to start by selecting Washington State. Let's choose 150 people. No, we'll go with 100. That's nice and easy. While that's generating, what this is going to do is this is basically going to allow us to give a basic idea of the risk levels based on testing today with a few other exceptions. As I scroll up here, we're going to start by looking at this circle. That's an 11% chance that 100 people gathering could have someone that has COVID-19. But you'll also see this triangle here. That represents about five times more, 44.24% chance of people being tested uh, with the virus. And of course, this square 69.01% chance, that's sort of the most extreme circumstance here. What these are is rough calculations based on the idea that maybe there are testing shortages, maybe there's a reporting lag, maybe there's a lot of asymptomatic people that are considered these silent spreaders. So what this does is it gives you sort of an overall look at what the worst case scenarios could be. So a group of about 100 people could see odds as worse as 69% that someone there has the virus, whether or not they know they have it. Of course, if you wanna take a closer look at this website, fully interactable and available right now, on creme.com for you to take a look at. Dana Marie. All right, thank you so much, Joshua. Ballots have been mailed out for Washington's fourth primary election. The election will determine which candidates move to the November general election for positions ranging from county commissioner to U.S. Congress. Our political reporter Casey Decker joins us with how past election years compare to 2020. I decided to focus on the biggest race in eastern Washington this year, the race for Congress. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers has four challengers this year, and as a metric of how intense this race is, I decided to look at how much money is being spent on it. So far this year, CMR has raised $2.3 million. The challenger with the most money raised, left-wing candidate Chris Armitage. He's raised roughly 60000 David Wilson, who's challenged CMR twice before as an independent, is running again this year, but as a Democrat. He's raised... 21,000. So is that normal? Not at all. For one, let's just compare it to CMR's last race in 2018. It was by far the most competitive election of her now 16 year tenure in Congress. By this time in 2018, Lisa Brown had raised over 2.4 million. McMorris Rogers herself a whopping 4.4. Now that was a unique year. Brown was a much higher profile candidate than the Democrats who typically run for the seat. 
So let's look at 2016, which like 2020 was an election year. CMR raised about 2.9 million by mid-July in 2016. At that time, Democrat Joseph Pakutis had taken in 128,000 and independent Dave Wilson, 175,000. So certainly less than Lisa Brown, but more than the candidates for this year. In fact, if you look at every election since Big Morris Rogers first won the seat, only twice before has the leading challenger raised this little money at this point in the calendar. The median amount raised at this point is nearly three times what Armitage has reported so far. So why is that? Why are Dems spending so little on this race this year? Well, there are a few likely reasons. For one, COVID-19. The pandemic has made it so many aspects of campaigning aren't physically possible. That means campaigns are spending less and therefore don't need to raise as much. And secondly, the candidates. Neither Armitage nor Wilson is an experienced Democrat with the kinds of connections that Lisa Brown had. They're trying to run more grassroots campaigns. And a third possible factor, the 2018 outcome. Democrats really gave it all they had in the midterms, and as a result, they came closer to beating CMR. But despite a nationwide wave of blue victories, they still couldn't topple her. That might have resulted in some donor fatigue, people just less willing to spend money on this race again. Casey Decker, Crime 2 News. Thank you very much, Casey. 741 on the dot this morning. The Spokane Police Department is warning the public to watch out for a new phone scam. The scam is asking for donations to help members of law enforcement and their families, but SPD says it's an unknown man who's been asking for donations through the mail or by credit card. SPD also says they will never call you to ask for monetary donations over the phone. And if you get one of these calls, you are encouraged to call Crime Check. Dr. Adam Swinyard is now sworn in as the new Spokane Public Schools superintendent. Swinyard was the associate superintendent of teaching and learning, but will now permanently replace Dr. Shelley Redinger with a two-year contract. Dr. Redinger resigned late last month after accepting the superintendent job for Richland School District. She had previously served as the SPS superintendent for eight years. This morning, police continue to investigate the death of a young black Spokane woman. 23-year-old Diamond Murrow died on June 28th, and shortly after her death, posts on social media accused Spokane police of not investigating a murder due to Morrow's race. A spokesperson from SPD responded, saying investigators are submitting samples to the state crime lab for toxicology. And on June 30th, SPD said they had started investigating her death could not comment on whether foul play was suspected. Police have said that they've answered calls about the death of Murrow from as far as Philadelphia and even in South America. Spokane County Medical Examiner says they are also conducting their own investigation. The Idaho mom whose children were found buried in her husband's yard has pleaded not guilty. Lori Vallow's attorney entered a not guilty plea to all charges facing his client this week, including conspiracy to destroy or conceal evidence. The bodies of Vallow's kids, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, were found last month on Chad Daybell's property. Neither Vallow or Daybell have been formally charged with killing the children. Earlier this month, Vallow's charges related to desertion of her children were dropped, and our lawyers asked Vallow's million-dollar bond be reduced again. Vallo will appear in court tomorrow for a pre-trial hearing. That is your morning rush. More news in less time. Let us know what's happening in your neighborhood. Sharing the hashtag up with Krem on social media. We'll be right back with more.